Hello everyone, again for another Tuesday night. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Elisa. I'm a junior here at Stanford. So tonight, Professor Johar is, pre is presenting about popes, princes, and pastors, community and authority in the medieval church. Professor William Dohar is an adjunct associate professor in the Religious Studies Department at Santa Clara University and a courtesy appointment to JST. His main areas of research, publication, and teaching are medieval Christianity, popular religion, the history of pastoral care, and Christian spirituality. He attended graduate school at, at the University of Notre Dame and earned advanced degrees there in theology and medieval history. He continued with doctoral studies at the University of Toronto attending the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies, where he received a licentiate MSL with a thesis on the papal registers of supplication in the 14th century. He continued research on his Toronto doctorate, a study of religion in the time of the Black Death at Oxford University, and resided with the Jesuit community at Campion Hall. After receiving his PhD, he returned to Notre Dame as an assistant professor and subsequently associate professor in the Department of History. From there, he joined the Religious Studies faculty at SCU and, in 2011, began a courtesy appointment with the Jesuit School of Theology. He is past director of SCU's graduate program in pastoral ministries. Professor Dohar has published two books in medieval church history and, and pastoral care. He is currently working on a social, religious, and legal study of the later 14th century based on a lengthy court case brought before the papal court in Rome. A related area of interest is monastic and Episcopal prisons in late medieval and early modern Europe. I personally can say I'm extremely excited for this talk. I love medieval Christianity, so I hope you guys get a lot out of it. And join me in welcoming Professor Dohar. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you all um, for welcoming me so warmly here. Um, it's funny to listen to one's Vita, uh, as, as just described, uh, when Lisa mentioned uh, what I did for my licentiate uh, degree at Toronto, I thought, did I do that? I, it's just so long ago, pa the papal registers of whatever, I'd forgotten it all. Of course, I forgot what I had for dinner about a half hour ago, so it's, it's the gift of the historian. Um, I was delighted, and I didn't get a chance to ask Nancy Greenfield why this topic, and, and by this topic I mean why the medieval church? because that's, that's how it came to me initially in terms of medieval governance and, and teaching authority. I thought, wow, what a great opportunity. I didn't think anybody was interested in the Middle Ages, and here we are with, of course, you all look desperately interested. I mean, you can read oh, your faces. I needed to know how we got from the band of Mary followers of Jesus and his disciples to the present <coughs> and some people unconsciously imagined <coughs> Jesus whispered in Peter's ear. You know, you're going to be able to get a nice red hat, some cute shoes, <laughs> and so I wanted the, the, the audience, the participants, to see Excellent. that this has been a, a work in progress. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, whenever I get a chance to teach a course in medieval history, medieval Christianity, if, if there's medieval in front of it, I, I, I make a special point to emphasize that so much of Western culture, society, um, institutions that we sort of lean on um, as a natural part of our, our everyday experience have their, their seed bed here in this thousand year epoch that we call the Middle Ages. <laughs> Middle Ages, as you may know, is a pejorative term. It, it was originated by scholars of the Renaissance. When they were looking, they were leapfrogging retrospectively to the glorious days of ancient Rome and, and ancient Greece. And there was this middle period, this medium avum, that they thought was a, a blight of darkness and superstition. So the Middle Ages has a kind of a bad press that uh, people like me who can't get other kinds of work had been trying to correct for a long, long time. Um, what I want to do tonight with you, I, I mentioned it's a thousand year epoch. Um, as I was thinking about this, and I, I did a number of versions of this presentation until last night I was inspired, I hope it was an inspiration, um, to treat you with kindness <laughs> this evening and to, and, and to give you what I've numbered as seven principles, seven governing principles, with governing in single quotes, to get an idea of, of how we got here. So 
this is, this is an image I begin with, and this is an image that you all know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's me and the graduating class of, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the wrong thing. This was just taken months ago. Of course, it's Pope Francis I uh, with uh, the vast majority of the Sacred College of Cardinals in some very well scrubbed uh, hall in the Vatican. When we think of leadership in the church, it's in a sense a no-brainer to think in terms of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, um, with awesome power and responsibility, and also this gathering of supporting clerics. That's what cardinal means. It comes from the word cardos, the hinge. These were the hinge figures of uh, the early Christian church in Rome. So the cardinals are meant to be advisors. So when we think of leadership, this seems to pretty much supply at least in the universal church, the, um, a pretty firm notion of what we mean by leadership. But Nancy's point of how we got here, I think is a really important one. And it's a, a very important one for Catholics to understand the kind of permutations uh, in the story of Christianity. One thing that has to be understood about Christianity, like any living thing, it, it has never existed in a vacuum. It has been constantly influenced by the cultures and all kinds of forces within those cultures that it inhabited, and it in turn has imparted any number of influences on the cultures that it was associated with. Not that we think of Christianity as some autonomous organism that travels through space and time, I don't mean that, but I do want to underscore the importance of seeing this as a very varied story. Uh, one that is very difficult to draw a straight line through. Um, you should all have a handout that has those seven principles. In fact, if I could have one of those two, I'd thank you, Nancy. So what I want to do is, is work tonight in, and I think what are going to be two, I hope, uneven um, sections. How long do I get to go for, by the way? 2 a.m., did somebody say? 8 what? 820, excellent, okay. So I'm gonna move through these seven principles with, with, with fair speed, and, and they'll be accompanied by some slides that I'll show you as well. And then I want to, to make this more concrete by turning this little gathering into a 13th century parish. And it'll call for some audience participation, but you won't have to get out of your seats and, unless you're moved by the spirit to do so, and then who am I to object, right? Um, but don't look too closely at that bottom part of the page. That's something we'll get to later. But I, I did think it would be important to make this concrete. And when we ask about leadership, your experience of leadership, the question of Catholic leadership, do you think in terms of the immediate vicinity around you? Well, you may. I mean, your leadership are the, the pastors who have been um, given the, the responsibility of shepherding you along the way. That's your concrete experience of church leadership. You'll also think in terms of sort of macro possibilities that we find in an image such as this. Um, so the first principle uh, I raise is, it is the Holy Spirit who leads the church, though sometimes in marvelous disguise. What I mean by that is that this is an act of faith. Catholics believe that a very human institution, which is peopled by saints and sinners, always has been since the days of the apostles, um, is also inspired by the Spirit. When people give themselves over to the Spirit, all right, so this is a God who's very jealous about free will, right? But we believe as Catholics that the Spirit guides the church. That's what we mean by the phrase pilgrim church on earth. This church, this community of Christ is on its way across the landscape of, of the ages to this place of perfection, the kingdom of God. However, the spirit works through fragile human beings. So you'll often get stories of incredible errancy, divergences from the path. And you kind of wonder, how could that possibly happen within a tradition that is meant to be infused by the spirit? Well, it happens because we're all imperfect beings and we're all prone to, to sin, as well as guided by grace towards holiness. So we also see within the chapters of the history of the church, these sort of radiant lights of, of wisdom and goodness and love. With respect to um, that spirit occupying the community, there's a phrase here that I, I have parenthetically in that first um, principle, the sensus fidelium. 
Now, what does that mean? The census fidelium literally translate, translates as the sense of the faithful or the, the notions of the faithful. What do I mean by that? Just four days in the New York Times, there was an article about this questionnaire. Have you heard about it? This questionnaire that is being initiated from the Vatican globally. It's phenomenal. Nothing like this has ever been done before. 39 questions that the Pope wants Catholics everywhere to weigh in on. Now, as has been happening a lot with this extraordinary man, uh, a number of people are downplaying the significance of this. Oh, you know, the Pope's not, he's not polling the world in order to see where the majority interest is. And there's some truth to that. The Catholic Church is not a democracy in that sense. The census fidelium is not the sense of the laity. The census fidelium is the sense of the entire community of Christ, the entire community. So like Benedict, St. Benedict in his rule for monks, he indicates that when the monks or, or the sisters gather in chapter, that is gather to discuss the issues that are important to them, the youngest novice, the person who just stepped in, should be attended to as well because the Holy Spirit might be speaking through that individual. So this is what we mean by the census fidelium. So when I, when I talk about leadership, I'm really talking about the spirit at work in the entirety of the community of Christ. Um, Another thing that I mentioned in that first principle is uh, the gradual ascendancy of the Church of Rome. This was news to me when I was about your age during the Punic Wars so many centuries ago, um, <laughs> that the, the papacy is a long time coming. It takes the first thousand years, the first millennium of, of, of a story that's two millennia long for the papacy to arrive at a place that's familiar to us. That's why I mentioned in my little blurb that, that Nancy solicited for me a week or two ago that when we think of the medieval story of the church, we can't really think in terms of a pyramid, you know, with the pope in this lofty place. There are assertions to that direction, but in terms of the lived reality of the Catholic Church and its leadership, I suggested um, a metaphor of a chess game being probably more apt, historically speaking, because of the importance of power and authority with respect to these various offices, secular and religious. The offices of king, queen, emperor, as well as the office of pope, cardinal bishops. So Rome has a gradual ascendancy. It takes some, some time for it to become what we recognize it to be. Um, when I was doing some of my theological studies, I remember this vividly that um, a theologian said, the phrase early church is inaccurate. He says, really look at the first, at least the first three or four centuries as the early churches, because that's what we have. We have a mosaic of Christianity with some of the most revered places being in what today is called the Middle East or Western Asia, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, one day it'll be Constantinople or Istanbul. These are, the, these are the holy sites, each having a patriarch, a shepherd who shepherds the, sheep, the shepherds. And then there is Rome. And Rome is unavoidable. Rome is unavoidable for two reasons. One is that it is the Church of Peter, and there is that recognition historically that there's significance there. And secondly, it's Rome. The Romans called that city the Caput Mundi, the head of the world. It was the center of everything. So whoever, I mean, even if Peter and Paul weren't associated with Rome, or Rome was not a place associated with the martyrs of the first three centuries of Christianity, it would still be significant because of its political identity. This becomes very significant in terms of who is the bishop of that place. The second principle, Christianity's relationship to the world has always been one of creative tension. Um, there's the distance between the evangelical impulse, go make of all disciples. This is what Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel. Get out there, get going, move. Take what I've told you and go out into the world. So Christianity is a proactive religion. But there's also this tradition that is very old within Christianity, which is called the contemptum mundi, a kind of a suspicion of the world. I mean, the world is full of all kinds of traps and deceptions. Uh, the world is also a, a transitory place. It is not our final home. Augustine reiterates this over and over again. Don't get lost in the journey. Our, our sights are to be set upon the kingdom of God. So don't get distracted along the way. So we have that as well. Let me um, show you that um, 
in the tradition, we have people who choose a reclusive way of life, who step away from the, the noise, the distractions of the world. We also have what's been called the church militant. You've got to get a look at this thing. <coughs> now, regard this image. It, it's, it, it's astounding, is it not? What do you see? Anyone, please. <laughs> you see warrior monks. You see Franciscans and Cistercians. I don't know if yet who's a Dominican over there. Is that, is that a Dominican? Maybe not. Um, trying to get you in here, uh, you two, two Dominicans here. Um, carrying blunderbusses over their shoulder on their way somewhere. Now, looking at this little graph that I've described, withdrawal and nonconformity on the one hand, and then on the opposite, domination and adaptation. These guys are not on their way to the cloister. They're not on their way to a contemplative retreat, right? I mean, they're clearly <coughs> doing something for Christ. And if that doesn't suit you, this should. I mean, there is a, a website called Zazzle <laughs> where you can actually buy things like this. Um, again, something I discovered late last night. And uh, I couldn't order enough for you to bring them tonight. But the church militant, what does that mean? When I was a kid, again, this is a long time ago, but there might be a couple of people in this room who know what I'm talking about. There was this song we learned at confirmation called An Army of Youth. Oh, and Ann Grich is nodding. Nancy, do you remember this? An Army of Youth fighting the battle of truth. Like yeah, we're fighting. For Christ the Lord. Heads lifted high, high. Catholic action, our cry. Our and the cross, our only sword. Stand up and sing, girls. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, it goes on like that. And it was, it was the, a song that we learned when we were preparing for confirmation. And it goes to this notion of the church militant that part of Christianity <coughs> is to go out and bring all people to Christ. Now. We, we need to see both of those in relationship to church leadership because what happens, interestingly enough, in the story of the papacy and the episcopacy and other places of leadership is very much getting woven, if not entangled, in the business of the world. We'll go on to these principles to let you see exactly how that happens. Number three, the imperial church changes everything. As a historian, I've, I've grown used to many years of nuancing and shading and talking about complications and subtleties. And <coughs> this is one chapter that is, it's in primary colors, it's bold. When Constantine enters the scene, when Constantine lifts Christianity up, literally, you know, from the catacombs, from the shadows, from persecution, it is a difference of night and day in a moment, historically speaking. You know, within 10, 15, 20 years, dramatic changes are happening in the Christian church. For three centuries, this church has been riding quietly at times, um, under the radar, as it were. Um, obviously, great stories of prophetic action, which met with martyrdom. This is a church that has grown used to these occasional bouts from um, imperial Rome in terms of the the, the seditious quality that at least they regarded the Christians with. The imperial church changes, changes everything. Bishops are accorded <coughs> the rank and dignity of governors. They're given um, armed escort from one meeting to the next. They, um, they receive extraordinary privileges in terms of um, economic assistance from the empire. Now, if you're the emperor, you're going to be a bit concerned about who your bishops are, right? Just as you would be about who your governors are. So what happens from Constantine on is that you have, this is the, this is the part that I call, is the Irish like to say, a gift with hooks. Right? We know what the gift is. We know that Christianity is now allowed to breathe freely. Um, people are pouring into the church because it's being favored by the imperial infrastructure. But things are happening so that the, person who, the persons who become bishop are significant enough that the emperor is interested to know, including the Bishop of Rome. So we do have these stories from Constantine on of emperors getting very involved in the selection of patriarchs of places like Constantinople or, or the Bishop of Rome. There is this um, <coughs> important story 
called the Donation of Constantine, which I, I, I need to mention to you. This is Constantine. This is the Bishop of Rome, Pope Sylvester. Now they're holding a mitre between the two of them. Um, it's not that Sylvester is giving the mitre to Constantine. Is Constantine giving the mitre to Sylvester? It's, it's an ambiguous picture. Notice that Sylvester has the halo, Constantine does not. Um, the story of the donation of Constantine is that this is a document that doesn't really make an appearance until the 11th century, but people were talking about it before then, probably from about the time of the 8th century. So this is a bit of an anachronism. I hope you don't get lost in it. The donation of Constantine was that the emperor was saying to the pope, look, I have established New Rome, the second Rome, Constantinople, formerly called Byzantium. That's the place where I'm going to be. You are the bishop of Rome. The entire West is yours. I give to you and to your successors suzerainty or power over the West. And this isn't just a spiritual authority. It was supposedly a temporal authority as well. Very, very rarely did the bishops of Rome assert this, but it was traveling around enough that most of these bishops of Rome, popes, believed in the legitimacy of the donation of Constantine. It wasn't until the early 1400s when a Renaissance scholar figured out it had to be a forgery because it was referring to liturgical movements and details of ceremony that weren't around until the 8th century. All right, so, but the point is that the bishops of Rome for a very long time had this perception in mind of this kind of range of power. Number four, um, the two swords. Let's see here. Actually, I, before we get there, this is a portrait of Ambrose, the bishop, and I, I wanted to mention here that even though the emperor and imperial officials oftentimes got involved in who became bishops, certainly the bishop of Rome, <coughs> there was always that principle of election. And that, this go, runs all the way through the Middle Ages. Now, how election is actually parsed, politically speaking, changes from time and place. I'll give you an example when we get to our little parish um, application here in a moment or two. Um, the story of Ambrose becoming bishop, it, it, it's a wonderful story where there is no bishop in Milan, there's this huge crowd gathered outside the, um, the, the, the Church of Milan, and Ambrose, who was a very smart lawyer, graduated from Stanford, top of his class, goes on to do administrative work. This is what he loved to do, administrative work. He's a catechumen, he's not even baptized, and some kid yells out, make Ambrose bishop. And it carries, it's like a wave, only verbally. Everybody is shouting, make Ambrose bishop. And by acclamation, he becomes bishop of Milan. So within a day, he's baptized, ordained a priest, consecrated a bishop, and there he is. Now, this is an extraordinary story. It didn't happen all the time. But the thing I want to get across is, is this seeming contradiction between emperors and kings saying, I want my second cousin to become the bishop of this place and, and make sure that it happens. And on the other hand, this elective principle that honored the voice of the faithful. I have this quote that's worth mentioning. Third century theologian, Northern African, named Cyprian of Carthage, had to say this about uh, electing bishops. He said, it comes from divine authority that a bishop be chosen in the presence of the people before the eyes of all, and that he be approved worthy and fit by public judgment and testimony. Okay, so we have early on enough in the story of the church this principle of everybody is involved in the selection of this bishop. Pope Leo the Great, one of the only two popes, at least currently, if John Paul is called the Great, there will be three popes in the history of the church called the Great, but this is Pope Leo the Great in the fifth century. He says, he who is to preside over all must be elected by all. That was his principle, fifth century. Okay, moving right along in terms of these principles, Number four, competition for authority over the world warrants clarification over and over again. What I mean by that is in this image. Can you make this out? Can you look at the top? Let me tell you that on the, on the right is a king kneeling, kind of, holding his scepter in his left hand, holding, um, well, really the, the butt of a sword in his right. And on the left is a bishop actually a pope, because he's got the triple tiara, sort of three runs. I'll say more about the triple tiara in a moment. Who's in the middle? Right. Jesus, okay. So, but notice that the, the two swords. Um, did you get this document that 
that has, do you have this with you? Okay, this was a, Nancy, did you get this document? Okay, um, it had, so, all right, it's okay that you don't have it, but listen to this. This is the, the, the Pope, whose name was Gelasius. You get all these names for, you know, for your kids someday out of the Middle Ages, so study the Middle Ages. Inexhaustible. He famously begins a letter to the emperor. This is the Pope writing to the emperor. He says, there are two swords, O mighty emperor, by which this world is chiefly ruled, the sacred authority of the priesthood and the royal power. Notice this. The sacred authority of the priesthood represented in the sword the pope has and the, um, the power of the royal power. Of these, the responsibility of the priests is more weighty insofar as they will answer for the kings of humans themselves at the divine judgment. You know, most clement son, and this is the pope referring to the emperor as his son, that although you take precedence over all mankind in dignity, nevertheless, you piously bow the neck to those who have charge of divine affairs. Okay, so this is an, and we have lots of these kinds of letters where popes realize that, that there is power right before them in terms of the, the potentially lost to <coughs> encroaching secular rulers. That's again why this chessboard I think is such a, a supple metaphor. You have moves being made and counter moves and you have bishops conceding power to kings and emperors and you also have the other thing happening in the other direction. Uh, there was a time in the church's history, uh, the 10th century, it's, it's called the nadir of the papacy. This is when the papacy is this political football being passed around by a few of the great dynasties of the city of Rome. It had, it's far from the days of Leo the Great or even Gregory the Great in the, in the late 500s, early 600s. Um, John the 12th is elected pope at the ripe old age of 20. Skateboards in the Vatican, imagine it. I mean, it's <laughs> that, that polished marble floor I showed you in the first image. Can you imagine that with a 20 year old Pope and a bunch of his friends? Extraordinary, he was not, as you might imagine, he was not a sort of glittering example of, of papal sanctity. Um, his enemies <coughs> claimed that he turned the Vatican Palace into a brothel. He was supposed to have died in his late 20s in bed with a woman. Some kind of stroke happened over him. Anyway. What happens in the case of John XII, then around the time that John is Pope, because there, there weren't a lot of saintly contenders in these, in these families from Rome, is um, that the emperor was brought down by contesting and, and frustrated Catholics to clean up the mess that the string of popes had, ca had caused. Um, and so the emperor, and this is a Christian emperor, these are the Germanic emperors, the, the Ottos up in, uh, up in Germany in the 900s, um, popes are banished from Rome and a person is placed there in the, in the, in the seat of Peter that the, the emperor knew would do a good job, would administer very well and also that the emperor could get along with. So when we talk about the, the theory of the two swords of temporal power and spiritual power, um, we do have these assertions by the popes about being greater, but in fact, sometimes the practice is less than great. And so we have the encroaching of, of secular authority. Um, another image I think that's really interesting is this of, of Justinian the emperor. And I'll point this out, this out very quickly. As you can tell from this image, look at Justinian's left hand. It's, it's obscured by this, this cloth that's veiled over it. You see it and he's sort of holding a, a container or a basket. Notice this in relationship to this man. This is the patriarch of Constantinople. So it looks here as if the emperor stands before the patriarch, right? But look at the feet. You, you can hardly make them out. But Maxentius' feet are in fact ahead of the emperor's. You, you have to sort of love the artist who designed this because what he's doing there is he's showing an emperor who has a halo, who's, and, and originally, by the way, halo indicates power more than sanctity. It develops that way in terms of the Christian tradition. Um, but there's this constant jarring of, of authority. Who's in charge? Who leads? Justinian, as Constantine before him, saw his power as not political and secular. 
he believed, as the emperors typically did, that they were emperor by grace of God. That's why we have that image of Jesus handing out the two swords. The power comes from Christ. So a lot of what happens with respect to this, these power plays I'm mentioning to you is as vocational in terms of the Christian emperor um, as it is horrific in the minds of some of these popes. Okay, Look, I'm aware of the time, gosh. Um, let me very quickly go through these, um, these last few. Um, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save number five for our, our parish thing because it, uh, it makes sense to do so. But, but this image is interesting. This is sort of an idealized version of the world. Church and state, we would use that kind of dichotomy. Medieval people didn't understand that separation. Again, because the Christian identity of the kings. But notice, the central figure is the pope. And you see that his crozier rises fairly high above everybody else. On his left, brandishing this very impressive sword, is the emperor. Notice that they are both encased, as it were, or, or sheltered by window um, structures, these, these Gothic arches of equal height. So there's a kind of a deference that's being paid to both emperor and pope. And yet you get this slight diminishment of imperial stature, just slight, because the head of the emperor is a little less than that of the pope. Uh, this is in a church in Florence, a Dominican church, in fact, Santa Maria Novella. Uh, and you see on the left, these are the lay authorities. You see there's a king next to the emperor and next to the king is probably some great prince or duke. And then a, sort of a gaggle of, of laymen and women, uh, artisans, uh, merchants, middle class people we would call them. And the lowest, of course, beggars and, and people um, in bandages. And then on the, I'm sorry, this is the right. That, that's Christ's left or, or the, uh, the emperor's left. Um, our left, the, the left of the image, is, is a, a gathering of, of clergy of, of various ranks as well. There's a Dominican and a, um, a Franciscan, Benedictine, Cistercian, they're all there. A happy old time. This is an idealized picture. This, it's called the way to salvation, and the idea was that these authorities should be um, very much in relationship to each other in a peaceful way. This is a detail showing you a bit, uh, a bit more of the Pope, looking very serious, the Emperor you know, looking off a little bit, like how long is this gonna last? I'm not quite sure. Do what, one of the two Dominicans wanna talk about the, uh, the hounds uh, at the bottom? Xavier, do you wanna say anything about those four-legged creatures? There was a dream that uh, had before Dominic's birth. Dominic's mother giving birth to a dog carrying a torch who would light the world aflame. And it was a wordplay. Dominic Dominicani, the Lord's dog. Okay, the dogs of the Lord. Thank you for that. One last uh, thing with respect to this principle had to do with the papal states. <coughs> and I'll make the point quickly. This is not just spiritual land, land for the church in terms of what it needs to do. What the papacy acquired over many years uh, was a good portion of Italy. In fact, it, it covers this great band that runs through the center of the, the Italian peninsula. It's because of the, the papal states, in fact, that Italy is not unified as a country until the 19th century, which is quite a long time for this to happen. But the papal states made the sovereign of the papal states, the pope, a very powerful person economically, politically. And some of these popes actually fought to keep those states intact. Julius II, who's the pope at the, in the early 1500s who commissions Michelangelo to do the Sistine Chapel, uh, is called um, a better warrior than he was a pope. He was often dressed in armor, astride a horse, leading his soldiers into battle. Um, I'm gonna sort of move along here because Time doth fly. I want you to look at this image for a moment. This, is, um, this would be under number six. The ritual is called investiture. What do you see happening in this picture? I'll just say that the, the person on our left is a king. Do you see the king with the crown? What is the king doing? He's engaged in an action here. I need one of you to say it. 
Because the Holy Spirit is hovering around, I know. I can tell. Say again? Okay, you know, that's one way to look at it. He is, in fact, <laughs> grasping. But, and, and the figure um, with the halo, maybe a pope, maybe a bishop. What has happened? Yes. You said that there's three thongs on the crown of the king. You said that's significance? That's a great question. It may well, maybe a, a Trinitarian reference for the sake of the author. And it might underscore this relationship that, that Christian kings had with the sense that God has given us this authority. He is giving the bishop the sign of his office, the crozier, uh, or, the, or the, the pastoral staff. The pastoral staff is meant as a kind of a crook that a shepherd would use to gather the stray sheep and to make sure they don't go wandering. But notice it's the king who is endowing the bishop with a symbol of his authority. Now, if you were anybody just looking at this, you would say, well, clearly the bishop is receiving his power, his authority to be a bishop from the king. There is this period of time from the mid 10 hundreds to the end of that century, so into the early years of the 12th century called the investiture struggle, where popes are going after uh, kings and princes and great lords because of this. They, they say that it's a confusion in sacramental theology that the, the power of a bishop or a priest comes from God alone, passing through the popes, and shouldn't be coming from any Episcopal or any royal authority. But here's the clincher, and it goes back to that image I had of the Papal States. There is land at stake. And, and this I'll illustrate when we get to our parish in, in one minute, so I'll, I'll hold off on that. The last thing I'm going to show you um, is that sovereigns, kings, queens, usually wear crowns, and this is the triple tiara of the popes. Uh, we think that the first triple tiara, the three crowns, um, it's not a horse race. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a papal crown. Uh, begins in the, um, the 11th century when all of this, um, these statements of, of authority on the, on the part of the popes are, are happening in the world. This is actually a crown that was designed and made for Benedict XVI, but was never worn, at least in public ceremony. Um, what the, what the three crowns actually mean is, uh, is debated. Nobody quite knows for sure. Um, but one of the prayers that said when the crown is placed on the Pope's head, and in fact it was Paul VI in the 60s, who is the last Pope to be formally crowned with a triple tiara, uh, receive the tiara adorned with three crowns and know that you are the father of princes and kings, crown one, the ruler of the world on earth. <laughs> Extraordinary. Crown two. The vicar of our savior Jesus Christ. Crown three. To whom is honor and glory through all ages. Now, I say this because again, the question that we're asking is how did we get here has so much to do with princely, kingly rule. It doesn't have that much to do with the inspiring ways of the spirit in terms of pastoring. Or you could say that that is subsumed into, into much of this. Um, I'm going to leave that there for the moment. And gosh, can I have two minutes? OK, great. Now, here's, I, I do want to illustrate this, how, what it actually looked like on the ground, because I think this will, this will bring things home clear in terms of it. how did people in the parishes understand all this sort of papal power and these assertions of great, <coughs> probably not at all. It didn't affect them. You know, it didn't really get down that far. But land was, was the common link. So I have created a parish called St. Mary's Stanford. It has a good British sound to it, don't you mean? <laughs> right. So you are the people. We are the people of St. Mary's Stanford. And we need a parish patron. By patron, now this is a person whose family for eight generations has owned the land on which the church was built. Don't think in terms of centralized structures. <coughs> They're not here. This is how it happens. Who wants to be the patron? Thank you. What is your name? Sheila. Sheila. This is Lady Sheila of Stanford, um, a woman of remarkable wealth and um, who owns the land. Her great, 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 great grandfather endowed the church with land to begin with. Because think of it. A community wants a church. Where do they get the church? It's not like they don't go to the bishop. The bishop says, I can't do anything for you. Go get some land. 
So they get the land from Lady Sheila's ancestors, and then they build it. Maybe they quarry stones from Lady Sheila's quarry somewhere down the, down the pike. Now, Lady Sheila has a cleric nephew. He's not a priest yet. Let's say he's a deacon. Let's give him the name Cal. Isn't that a good name? Okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> Who would be the, who's, who's the cleric nephew of Lady Sheila? We need a guy for this. Come on, put a hand up. There you go, and your name is? What's your name? Connor. Connor? Okay, Connor, Connor is a cleric. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna say what's gonna happen to him in a moment. We need a bishop. We need a bishop. Come on. Yes, Bishop. Troy. Bishop Troy of, where are you from, Troy? Anford. Where again? Anford. Anford. Okay, Bishop Troy of Anford is, um, is, the, is the local bishop. Um, there's a community of Beguines, a group called Beguines. We need five women, just raise your hands. Five, and there's Anne is one, Nancy. Oh, we got a whole crowd of, okay, we have Beguines. Now, Beguines were lay women who lived in community. And uh, they worked together, they prayed together. Some of them were married. They would take a break from their marriages with their husbands. <coughs> and it was all, all count, you know, uh, under the uh, authority of the bishop. The husband might want to go on um, a, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That's what he's telling his wife he's going. No, he goes off for a couple of years and she says, well, good, because I want to join the Beguines down the street. So this is a lay group. We're gonna come back to them in a minute too. Um, we need a local Dominican friar. Where can we find a Dominican friar? <laughs> Okay. Father Nathan is the Dominican friar. Um, we need a church warden. A church warden is the guy who kind of, uh, who, is there a, a finance major anywhere in the room? Anybody in finance? Are you kidding? What the heck's going on here? No finance majors? How about economics, uh, administration, uh, pre-law? <laughs> yeah, try engineering, all the hands go. Okay. Who's, who wants to be a church warden? Who's Gary? <laughs> Gary? Gary has an MBA, and did, did you notice Gary, Gary was actually slipping off his chair to the floor. Gary is the church warden. Okay, here's an event. There is a vacancy, what's called a vacancy. The old priest at the age of 90 was hit by a truck while he was on a marathon race in London. So Father O'Shaughnessy is gone. Now, there is no pastor at St. Mary Stanford. So how do we get a priest? Well, here's what's interesting. <coughs> Lady Sheila is, she makes the call here. Now this is happening all over Europe. This is happening all the way to the time of the Reformation. <coughs> it's called the right of presentation. And it's actually a legal right. It, it, was, it was considered legally a piece of property. Sheila could sell it, she could divide it between her children, she could um, give it away if she wanted to, give, give it to the bishop. Bishop Troy, right? Okay, Bishop Troy is going to come on the scene in a moment. Um, so Lady Sheila says to uh, the community, well, I'm going to, to nominate my nephew. Your name again? Connor. I'm sorry, my, my nephew Connor. Um, to the, to, and so she says, Connor's the guy. She writes a letter to the bishop. Troy gets the letter and he says, okay, I want to talk to Connor. So Connor goes to the bishop. Now, what kind of training has Connor had to be a priest? There are no seminaries before the 16th century. So whatever training a priest got was either from old father O'Shaughnessy who got hit by the bus in London at the marathon or, or whatever he could scramble. And now, in, in fact, Connor has been at Oxford for a couple of years, so he's a smart guy. Now, does he know much about being a priest and pastor? Who knows? He goes to the bishop, Bishop Troy interviews him, and what is Bishop Troy's judgment on Connor's aptitude for leading the parish of St. Mary Stanford. <laughs> now, okay, that's interesting. Bishop Troy just gave, gave a thumb down, just for those who couldn't see. Now, Troy goes back to Lady Sheila. Now, what is she, Lady Sheila gonna do? Think chess game. Kick her out of your land. <laughs> Kick who out of your land? <laughs> the bishop. Well, you know, you might, you might decide to to lean on the bishop somehow, depending upon who you are and who your family is. And the bishop might be very hesitant to do this, Bishop Troy, all due, res <laughs> all due respect, because th th there's a lot going on here. Or let's say that you, you decide, Bishop Troy, that, that, that Connor can have the parish, he has the parish. Uh, he comes back and um, he's administrating things fairly well. 
But there's a problem in the parish, and it has to do with our group of Beguines. Now, Beguines, because they're not nuns, they've not taken any vows, they're not married women, at least they're not acting and living like married women, um, they're not on the church's radar, so Bishop Troy doesn't quite know what to make of them or what to do with them. So Bishop Troy says, I need an Orthodox preacher who knows theology well enough, who can influence these, these women, maybe be their chaplain, and he calls upon the Dominican friar, Father Nathan, who comes into the picture, and in fact, there is this wonderful tradition of Dominicans being chaplains for these groups of, of lay women living as, as Beguines. Bishop Troy visits Stanford, St. Mary Stanford, and he finds that, and this is kind of a concluding point that I'll make, that the church is, needs some refurbishing. Sorry, Connor, you're not doing your work. The, the roof is, the roof over the sanctuary, let's say the altar is here, the roof is leaking. <coughs> um, and the cattle are grazing in the cemetery to great disrespect. So the cemetery needs to be gated and walled. That's how we get you know, walls around cemetery gates. It goes way, way back to make sure the cows don't graze, the, the pigs aren't rutting up, you know, Aunt Agnes for crying out loud. So you don't want that going on in the cemetery. The church warden, Gary, comes into the scene. Now, Gary has the key to the coffers of the church that the lay people donate to on a regular basis, not Connor. Connor's, Connor's got income coming from elsewhere. Now, out of the coffers that Gary has access to, because the laity, by the way, the, the parish has elected him to be their church warden. He's like the parish manager. Okay. Um, they fix, you guys fix your part of the church beautifully. Connor has to come up with cash to fix his part because the priest had what was called the chancel, the, that area over the sanctuary or the altar, and the people, the, par the parishioners had what we call the nave or the, the, the large part of the church. You have some, some beautiful pictures of late medieval churches where the naves are gorgeous, spectacular, ornate, and a shabby chancel because the priest didn't have the cash that the laity had. Now, sometimes the laity would want to um, embellish and, and beautify the, 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 the sanctuary as well. One last thing, and I promise this is the very last thing, a group of parishioners uh, led by Leo here. Leo, do you have a, a trade or a, an occupation? I'm a woodworker, metal worker. Excellent, so okay. So okay. Now, Leo is head, <laughs> Leo is head of, a, of a local pious confraternity of carpenters, woodworkers, um, whose patron saint is? Good, St. Joseph the Carpenter. Now, what Leo wants to do, because they, they've, they've amassed some money on the side, they want to establish a separate altar, like a chapel within the church. And they do. They've got a chapel and an altar, and they want, they want a priest to pray every day for the repose of the souls of members of the confraternity. Now here's the clincher. They hire the priest. Has nothing to do with Connor. Connor might have an assistant who's taking care of the parish, but they hire their own man. They pay him. Uh, they fire him if they don't like what he's doing. So, so when we talked about at the beginning tonight of that census fidelium, I mean, it is a spiritual faith statement that the spirit is guiding. What I want to convey to you though, over the medieval centuries, the permutations of authority and leadership happen all over the game board. It's not all about what the Pope says from Rome. That does happen, and it's significant. There's a whole chasing down of heresy that's generated from Rome, and the Dominicans are, are very important preachers of the truth for that whole period of the church's history. But there is lower to the ground um, this very important dynamic that happens, a lot of it economically based, a lot of it having to do with land and money, which also promotes the pastoral care of the people. I, I've gone over time. I hope that, that I've said enough to give you some ideas uh, for your discussions that you're heading into. But I, again, thank you for not throwing things at me because my students at this time would, would probably be doing that. So thank you. Thank you.